Do you want to maximize your GDP growth and increase your liquid reserves? This is the guide for you. All right, lads, welcome back to Hearts of Iron 4, the new order. Today we're going to uh, do a short guide, um, well, relatively short because it doesn't take too much, um, on both GDP growth and, and thus GDP in general, as well as liquid reserves or just, you know, surplus. So for the GDP growth, um, as you can see here, it says plus 3.04% base rate. Generally, every country has a base rate of GDP growth, and it says plus 7.113% from country modifiers. Now, this could be something like a national spirit, for example, um, the Das Entscheidungsnetzwerk, which grants us an additional annual GDP growth factor of plus 0.3%. Now, obviously, that's barely anything monthly, but hey, 0.3 is 0.3. We also have things like 0.00% um, from our surplus. If you're in a deficit, you will have an increased GDP growth because Keynesianism good, not. Um, so the, uh, often on the Reddit you'll see if you want inc an increased GDP growth, have a deficit. I'm not a Keynesianist. I don't like that. Um, plus, uh, we have a massive GDP and GDP growth anyway. But if you were just solely focused on GDP, have a deficit. Um, generally, the bigger the deficit, the better. However, that will lead uh, to things like debt, which we'll be covering soon. Um, for example, our GDP growth rate multiplier is 1.16 times. One, 1 is the base multiplier. 0.17 is the country modifiers. Again, national spirits and things like that. And we have plus 0.199 from our infrastructure. If you have maximum infrastructure in the states that your country uh, it has, a, um, in states that a country considers to be a core, for example, for us, I don't know, Austria, the, all the Austrian states, or for us also, um, all of Ostland and Poland, as well as Norway, because I did that, um, then you will increase your GDP growth. Um, if you have maximum infrastructure, you will get the 0.2. Uh, where is it? Yeah, you will get the 0.2 multiplier. Now we only get the 0.199 because despite us having a massive infrastructure network, let me just quickly show it off. Uh, we have not quite finished um, building up the infrastructure in Norway. We're just five levels of infrastructure away from getting that glorious 0.2. As you can see here, it says 0.199 from 1,095 built infrastructure out of 1,100. If we get that 1,100, we get the 0.2. Now we have minus 0.223 from taxes, and, and that's divided up between income taxes, business taxes, and sale taxes. Generally, the lower the, the, the taxes, the higher the, G, the uh, GDP growth. This is why, um, as long as you're in a good surplus, and the uh, game writes, as long as you, well, for me anyway, I have zero debt, um, you will generally just want to do the temporary tax cut, and that will increase your GDP growth roughly, for me, generally always around 0.5%, which is significant. We also have things like um, plus 0.014 from our trade balance. Trade po Positive trade balance, good. Negative trade balance, bad. For, for uh, your nominal GDP growth. Then you have inflation, which is deducted from your nominal GDP growth. Um, I doubt it's in real time, but it's certainly monthly or, yeah, monthly. Uh, so our inflation rate is 4.3111%, uh, 4.311% um, base inflation rate. And again, this changes from things like national spirits focuses obviously we got a bunch of inflation from doing the oil crisis tree Grr. we but we have a negative 1.364 percent from the natural variation of inflation as far as i'm aware you have no control over this that's why it's called the natural variation that could be a negative as it is here it's very very nice negative 1.3 percent that's astounding however it could also be not only um a, you know say a break even but it could also be a positive inflation which will further reduce your GD, uh, gdp growth for example, it says here, last month's inflation of 2.94% has the following effects, giving us a negative 1% factory and dockyard output, as well as negative 1% construction speed and consumer goods production factor. And then obviously, uh, your real GDP growth, annual GDP growth, is 8.846% uh, for us, and it breaks it down into the monthly uh, GDP growth, which is 0.73%, which isn't a lot, but hey, 8.8% uh, yearly is pretty damn good, especially for Germany in a timeline where, well, in this timeline. And, and with all the uh, things that we did in this run. Look at that. Glorious, glorious Einheit's Pact. Now, other things that will increase, um, not your GDP growth, but your GDP, is who you do and don't have as puppets. For example, we, um, Realms Commissariat Caucasian here, um, the, their status as an autonomous Realms Commissariat gives uh, uh, fi us 5% of their GDP, which is fantastic, but it also gives them a negative 5% GDP growth boost. Then we have, um, let me find an integrated Realms Commissariat. I actually don't believe we have any. 
uh, we do have a realms land though. For example, here, uh, a, a realms land, you will see a lot of these if you do a spear run and don't choose the um, collaborator states. You will see, for example, you'll see a lot of realms land, realms lands, which will give you 2.5% of their GDP. And we'll also give, give them a 4% GDP growth boost. Because um, realms land are basically just, um, realms landers are more efficient than realms commissariats. And then obviously if, uh, if you go for the even more... I hesitate to say autonomous, because it basically isn't, but say more native run, and admittedly autonomous does work in a way. Um, you will get less of their GDP, but I imagine each realm's land will get an increase to their GDP growth. Now, let's talk about debt, because it becomes more and more important the uh, better your credit rating is. For example, if you have a junk credit rating, the effect of debt on your GDP growth is minus 50%. You basically don't need to worry about it. However, it also does give you negative 20% stability, and it also has a lot... Is that a lot more of an effect? Yes, a lot more of an effect on your interest rates. For example, your interest rate here is 25%. God help you. Now, as you get a higher and higher credit rating, debt has more of an effect. For example, for us, we're on level 9 exceptional. Uh, the effect of debt on GDP growth is plus 15%. Um, other countries like uh, superpowers, mainly. Like Japan and the United States will have something similar. Perhaps they're prime or exceptional or good even. Who knows what they are. I don't believe I have a way of checking. Let me just quickly look at their economy. Yes, I do not have a way of checking. Um, that is a terrible growth rate. And we're only like 10 billion behind you. That's good to know. Anyway, back to the economy. You will generally want to wipe out as much debt the better your credit rating is. That's why I wiped out the debt. And, well, for this and as well as I don't like being in debt. However, um, having um, a higher credit rating will also give you a stability boost as well and have a negative 80% for us effective debt on interest rates, which is fantastic. The higher your credit rating, the lower your interest rates, which is always good, because your interest rates are things like debt servicing. The higher your interest rate is, the higher the debt servicing. Obviously, ours is 0, 0.00 billion because we have no debt, therefore we have to service no debt. Uh, so yeah, debt bad for GDP growth, the better your credit rating is. Now, talking about reserves. Uh, when you were in a surplus, monthly, you will get an increase to your reserves. You can then use the plus or negative arrows to uh, inve either pay off debt, which will just, you know, eliminate debt, you never guess it, or invest it into your economy, which will increase your real GDP growth. Uh, well, I suppose it increases nominal, which therefore increases real. Naturally, the more you invest, the more of an increase in your nominal GDP growth you will get. However, you can only do this occasionally. You can't just invest every time you have a surplus, which is incredibly annoying. Uh, that should be changed. If there's an auto payment button, there should be an auto invest button. However, over time, investing this money in the economy will kind of just kind of wear off. So keep doing it. Generally kind of build up as much as you can and then hit, hit invest for a big boost. Of course, naturally you won't be able to invest again for a while, but hey, what can you do? Now, that's uh, pretty much it for debt. And of course, if you... Uh, well, I suppose it's not pretty much it. If you, if your debt gets too high, if it gets if it uh, gets above, above your debt ceiling, you will hit what is known as critical debt. And um, if fiscal crisis starts flashing, you will get a national spirit called fiscal crisis looming. I believe it's a picture of a pig uh, that's broken into a broken piggy bank. And this national spirit will give you a negative 5% annual GDP growth factor, which is horrible. Um have because na negative uh, annual GDP growth factors are always uh, horrible to have so do not let your debt get too high if you're doing the whole strategy of having a surplus a negative surplus a deficit if you will <laughs> um, and then if the fiscal crisis actually hits it'll take six months to hit you'll be in an even you'll have an even bigger national spirit which will give you an even bigger negative annual GDP growth rate factor you can get rid of this um, fiscal crisis by taking a bunch of decisions and after a while it would begin it will begin to reduce and then eventually finally it will go away entirely assuming you're you've done enough to reduce the debt now that I do believe is pretty much oh, okay. one last thing for uh, GDP growth your inflation policy I suppose you could call it um, you will generally always want to have fresh off the presses which will give you a 1% increase in your nominal GDP growth um, 
you should kind of it's pretty much the best one however if your inflation is over about five percent then you should do count your pennies which will um, decrease your base inflation rate up to a three percent total reduction um, with it reducing your inflation rate by 20 percent so over five five percent or over go for count your pennies otherwise just stick on fresh off the presses fight poverty is effectively worthless and the only reason you should do power things up is if you're playing as a russian stateless and you temporarily need power to use your production units. Um, however, once you get to regional stage, and, and even before that, like you're not like you're not going to need power things up. This is effectively built especially for the Russian statelets, which is nice, but I've never used it. I probably should though. Now, if you are in a deficit, um, a monthly deficit, you can adjust the inflation slider, for the money creation. If you want a surplus, you cannot touch it, which is good. Um, you can jack it all the way up. I wouldn't advise doing so. Uh, yes, money creation allows us to print money, greatly inflating our economy, but also allowing us to dodge potentially dangerous deficits through giving us extra funds due to the great risks of money printing. It is only enabled when we have a deficit. Generally, just you won't be able to touch that if you're in a surplus, but he, he right, I think even if you're in a deficit, you should probably just leave this alone. Now, onto liquid reserves. Now, liquid reserves are much easier. Um, more money good, um, less money bad. So, for example, our army expenditures here are 36 billion. Naturally, if the size of your army decreases, and our army is quite large right now, we have roughly 1.2 million men in the field because we just concluded the second West Russian conflict. Now, if we were to get rid of all of these men, then our um, logistics as well as maintenance funding would drop to zero, no matter how much, or how much we did or didn't adjust it. It would be zero because we have no army naturally. However, if we did have men in training, it would also not affect the maintenance and logistics, which I think needs to be looked at. Because currently, as a Russian conflict uh, lord or stateless, you can have a bunch of men in training and uh, no men in the field just to be ready to, you know, pump them out for a, a potential conflict. Um, well, chances are you'll probably know whether or not there's going to be a conflict. However, the R&D funding, while you can adjust it here, it will, like, you will never have an R&D funding of zero, in my experience. Even if you're not researching a single military tech, you will have an R&D funding expense. Because um, it's kind of just saying, you know, military technology is generally always kind of being worked on, no matter what you are or aren't researching, which is odd. And uh, the procurement funding, if you have zero uh, production units assigned to military factories, then your procurement funding will be zero. Naturally, you assign uh, production units to military factories, procurement funding goes up, and then you can adjust it to have um, either, I believe, yeah, negative 25 or plus 25 uh, factory output, as well as production efficiency growth. You can also adjust things like social spending, administration expenses, science expenses. Uh, science expenditure, I generally tend to uh, keep research all the way jacked up because it's incredibly useful unless I'm in a serious deficit and I need to get out of it or else I'll hit the... Uh, looming fiscal crisis. I generally just keep that jacked up so I can get through research faster, thus research more things. Research facilities to, to keep that jacked up is nice, however it's not essential. It does give you 2.55 which is actually quite good now that I'm looking at it. Okay, yeah, it actually might be worth it to keep that jacked up. Then you have administration, uh, which affects the effectiveness of your policies. Your safety policies, your, um, your pollution policies, and your uh, security policies. And the bureaucracy funding gives you an increase in your taxable population as well as stability. Now, if you are a Russian stateless, then increasing the uh, bureaucracy funding to get an increase in your taxable pop uh, population probably isn't worth it. Because chances are, due to your... Let me quickly check it. Due to your administrative efficiency, you're not taxing enough of the population. Depending on who you start at, uh, start as, for example, I believe if you start as Rodzevsky, your base taxable population is 80%. I think you actually start with a non-existent state apparatus. I, yeah, I don't think it's Ill illegitimate. Also, I hate the fact that as Borman you went to illegitimate. Like, are you serious? Like, what? Just because we uh, did the second night of the Long Knives? That's just... It's nonsense. It, it's just weird. Like, a massive reduction in the monthly tick? Sure, but just decreasing it? Ridiculous. Anyway back to this so it could be worth it it could be not worth it and um, the higher your administrative efficiency the more worth it is to increase your bureaucracy funding also stability is always just nice just for the whole host of stability uh, of the, for just for the whole host of buffs that stability brings factory and dockyard output construction speed division organization and recovery rate as well as daily political power gain and resistance targets in occupied territories now you have nuclear expenditures if you increase this um, I'll uh, quickly uh, stop decommissioning warheads. Deactivate that. So our monthly production is 76 warheads. If we were to increase this, um, 
Our nuclear stockpile will change by... Yes. We'll go from 76 warheads a month to 110 warheads a month. If you want more heads, then, then go for it. Personally, just in the name and the interest of liquid reserves, I would just immediately, at the start of the game, if you're a superpower, like America, Japan, or Germany, just immediately begin dismantling 1,000 a month and, uh, and drop it down to the minimum of 3,500. And just keep going and basically just never disable it. Because there's no reason to spend money on a thing that you're only going to use if the game ends. And if the game ends, then you're no longer playing. So, yeah. Keep um, 1,000 a month um, decommissioned as well as uh, the minimum stockpile of 3,500, and just keep nuclear expenditure on zero. Unless, I don't know, maybe you're playing Italy and you want to get some nukes, or you're playing Burgundy, you want to roleplay, or you're playing Russia and you want more nukes. Now, naval expenditure, again, this is effectively useless. Um, unless, I, I can only assume, uh, if Hootig uses gas in the South African conflict, and you're playing as America, and you want to send your navy in to crush the fleets of the uh, African realms commissariats. Other than that... Uh, it gives you stability, and it gives you conflict support. It also gives you dockyard output, and it gives you a whole bunch of uh, naval buffs. But of course, if you're if you're engaging in naval conflict, then like you know, uh, conflict uh, no world conflict three is already started again. It's kind of worthless. But if you're in desperate need of stability, jack it up. Otherwise, just have it hammered home to zero. Army expenditures is the only really real one of military expenditure that you're going to have to worry about. I find it interesting that there's no air force expenditure. I find that incredibly interesting. Uh, it does give you air range plus five percent, but yeah, air force would really be its own thing. Um, as far as I'm aware, that's pretty much it for um, the liquid reserves. It, it's uh, God, it's, it's so much. Uh, it's a much better system than what it used to be. Do you remember where it was just like invest or oh my God, that whole system with just the buttons was was mad. But um, yeah. Um, Liquid reserves is pretty self-explanatory. You can see your total expenditure here, your military expenditure here, civilian expenditure here. Hmm. And naturally, if you do civilian austerity, then you um, then civilian spending factor is hit with a negative fifteen percent no, debuff or buff. Depend uh, depends on what you'd class as. Oh, I nearly forgot the most important thing for GDP growth. Um, so if you go to either construction or production and click the production units tab, you can see where you assign your production units. Which is fine. You'll, you're probably very acquainted with this. However, if you go to the economy tab and click the production units, then you will see this little bar. You need the consumer goods. Now, if you drop this down, it takes 30 political power each tick, then your nominal and thus, I suppose, your annual and your real GDP growth will decrease. If you jack it up, then it will increase. Spend more on consumers, get a higher GDP growth. Um, unless, uh, again, you're in a... I don't know... If you don't have enough political power, I suppose, or if you're really desperate for production uh, units for your uh, military factories as maybe a Russian conflict lord, then you would have it uh, either probably at zero. But otherwise, just keep it jacked up. There's no reason not to. As it says here, it uh, increases your economic growth and stability. And if you reduce it or have it at, say, I won't say zero because you can't have it at zero. If you have it at the minimum requirement, then you will suffer. Well, I suppose you won't quite suffer, but you'll just, you just won't receive the buffs. Or maybe you will suffer. Who knows? you will not receive the economic growth as well as stability buffs. Yeah. Obviously, you can see your production units that you get from trade here and the other ones. Um, oftentimes, as a Russian conflict lord, you will see, or you will get a focus, rather, that will just give you production units. I believe I saw one um, for Tukhachevsky uh, for when he deals with Vlogda, though I could be misremembering. Again, military austerity will just decrease the amount you spend on the army, but also give you a slew of horrendous debuffs. Um... I suppose this would be worth it if you were playing, um, say, a Russian conflict lord and you just wanted to decrease. This doesn't seem to uh, affect your research speed, so him right. If you just unified as Rodzevsky in late 64 or 65, and uh, yeah, as a Russian conflict lord, you should generally just immediately disband your army uh, as soon as you hit a uh, regional stage. I'm not quite sure if you should do it at super regional stage. Uh, you know, depending, it depends on re it really depends on who you're facing. You could rebuild it, but you know, with the whole training thing, then you want to get to regular. Might not be worth it. Maybe a, a decrease, certainly. But um, I suppose what would be advised uh, is when you get super regional, immediately train up a whole bunch of divisions that you wouldn't otherwise be able to train um, because you'd have deleted your army and you'd be limited to say 100,000 men, and then delete your army. That's what often what I do as Rodzevsky. 
Yeah, because the army is just a it's just a dead weight for four or five years. You just do not need that, especially as Radzievsky and um, especially as any Far Eastern statelet, because you have a whole bunch of decisions to develop the Far East, and you do not want to get hit with either a looming fiscal crisis or, you know, an ongoing fiscal crisis. But that's kind of good advice for any Russian conflict lord. Now I uh, think that's about it. Yeah, um, if you found this guide interesting, please consider liking, subscribing, and commenting down below and supporting the channel on Patreon. Also, I'll leave a link in the, both the description and the pinned comment to other guides that I've done uh, for a general economic overview in the New Order. That was a, a good few months ago. Um, this one it was specifically for the surplus and the GDP growth, but of course, that's all the economy really is, apart from the military and uh, social spending. But yeah, hope you enjoyed. I hope you enjoyed the Borman series. I've scheduled this video to release after the last episode of the Borman series. And for the next series, uh, I know I said that I wouldn't do another series, but I actually have begun another series, which I've kind of um, told a few people throughout comments on videos that I've released. See you then.